Our great Savior, what a wonderful song. Open your Bibles for preaching this morning to the book of Philippians in chapter 3. The book of Philippians in chapter 3. He said, didn't your dad just preach on this text last week? Yes, but you know, there's more than just one message that can be preached from a text. I'm actually not using his same verse. He's using, he used verse 10. I'm using verse 14 and 13 and 14. I will, however, be referring to verse 10 in the message. I'm going to be speaking on the subject this morning. You can see it in your bulletin. Reaching forth unto those things which are before. Every year we're given a new start. The wonderful thing about God establishing a year, and you know that's why we have the sun, the moon, the stars. The Bible says they were given for days, for weeks, for months, for years, for seasons. And God has structured life in little bite sizes. We have 24 hours. We have, a, we have a day. We have a week. God made the worlds in six days. Then the seventh day, the Bible says he rested. And so he's a very orderly God, very structured God, and the way he designed this world is that as it turns on its axis, everything is for a reason. There's a, there's a morning, there's an evening, there's a day, there's a night. And I believe that every year is a new opportunity. It's a new beginning, if you will. And so this is 2013. You're already having trouble writing that? I have a couple of times. I've already written a couple of 2012s, forgetting that it's now a new year. It's hard to believe. It just that last, last year just went by like that. And so I want to look into this new year with that idea, with that thought, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Our Heavenly Father, we pray now that you would bless us as we study this text and God, I pray that you would help this message to challenge us, to stir us, to, if you will, to set a blaze and a flame our hearts again, to do more than we ever have. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when you study commentaries, you, you think that sometimes learned men know everything. But it's amazing when you study and you look at the comparisons of what other people take from a text, sometimes how little that you actually find by the commentators on specific texts. And how, you know, we, don't, we, we talk about not plagiarizing, right, and, this, and that copywriting and so forth, that's, that's a bad thing. But did you know, if you just change a few words here or there, that, that you can get by with it? And it's amazing that when you get to certain texts, that a lot of the commentators are simply rehashing and just rewording a little bit what Matthew Henry said, or what John Calvin said. And so because they look at a commentator, what they do is they miss what God says, and miss what the Holy Spirit is saying. And sometimes they miss the text itself. As I was preparing this, uh, I, I got this, um, this message um, later on in the week. My son-in-law and I, we spent some time, uh, they are, they're rolling out their new theme this year. And, and uh, so I began to start thinking, well, you know, I wonder what, if, if I were to look at this year, what would I, and, and so I, I spent a restless night at the expense of Linda, okay? Um, when I get something in my head, I'm, I'm similar to my dad that my, the wheels keep turning while you're supposedly asleep. And I was tossing. She said, what in the world were you dreaming about? I got my message. I had all my outline and everything for the message that night. Okay? I don't know how long. I, I don't know if it was two hours or three hours or whatever. That, but I, I, you know, I had it all. And so then, then as it came together, I saw some things in this text that by studying the context that I had not seen that really gave new light to these verses. These are very well-known verses. We, we, I've heard these verses quoted. I've preached these verses 
uh, probably hundreds of times. These are good verses for kids. These are, good, these are verses to charge you up. But when Paul wrote this, he wasn't a young buck. When Paul wrote this, he was at the ebb of his life. He was a senior. It would not be long, and Paul would be beheaded. And so I want you to understand that as we, we look at reaching forth into those things that are before, is we're not talking about just young people. Okay? So this message, even though they're all right here in the front row, and they, don't they look just angelic? Huh? You say, not my kid, okay? Well, but they, at least right now, they look like it, okay? But it's not a message for the teens, although they should be able to apply this. This is a message for all of us to look at us, to look at individually, because every one of us must give account of himself to God. Jumping right in the message, if you look, Paul makes a statement in verse 13, which, if, if you're taking notes, or you're making an outline, you want to take this with you, take your bulletin, does, do we have, yeah, we have space on the back of the bulletin. You can make, make notes. So you can put the title, put the text, Philippians 3, 13 and 14, and write this. First point, Paul had a single-mindedness or a singleness of purpose. That's the first point. We all must have a singleness of purpose in the Christian life or we will not accomplish anything. Here's why. Because we become distracted. This, the, this, Paul uses illustrations. Some of the words that he uses in this text relate to running. I asked my wife permission and she told me no. I bought some really cool brand new tennis shoes because uh, some of you know Pam and some of you, I've, I've been dealing with plantar fasciitis since July. And so I finally broke down. I paid $70 for tennis shoes. I've never ever purchased a pair of tennis shoes for $70 and these and, and retail they would have been $170 now that's ridiculous okay <laughs> but I got them on sale up at the outlet and they're called Air Max they are the newest like shoe for Nike okay and I must say the last three days it's starting to go away I'm tickled pink okay so I asked her today can I get by with wearing those? Because they, they have gray, and they have kind of a salmon color. And, and that well, the, yeah, so they're neon, so what? But anyway, but, but anyway, I have a gray suit, okay? So I'm thinking, and I'm speaking about running a race and doing that kind of stuff. I thought that'd be cool to come with my... Would, wouldn't that have been great? Well, you guys would have loved it, right? All you old fogies, and you too. You're 50 now, you remember that. Yes, she knows that. Everybody knows that. She's a part of the Salt Club, an official part of the Salt Club now, okay? But anyway, back to the message. Verse 13, Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. That means Paul is, Paul is saying, I haven't achieved yet what I want to, what I want to be, where I want to go, for Jesus. I'm not arri I haven't arrived. I've got more that I know God wants me to do. So he says, I've not obtained yet. I'm not I haven't obtained the prize. But look what he says. This next statement, this is what I want you to get in relation to that singleness of purpose, single-mindedness. He says, but this one thing I do. Now that is focus. That is determining that I am not going to allow sin, the world, or the devil to distract me from my goal, from my purpose, moving forward. Paul lived this way. And most of us don't live with that much discipline. We're kind of willy-nilly. Paul got up every day with the same purpose. The same mindset every day. That's what drove him. And that singleness of purpose was to win a prize. He, he expresses that in verse 15. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize. 
of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, for years, as I have looked at that, I thought, okay, well, that's, that's got to be reward. That's got to be the crowns that God is talking about. That is God, the high calling of God, that, that almost like that he wanted to be first place, or he wanted to be elevated to a status and, and to a position of honor at the end of life, the greatest Christian. But after looking at the text, I don't believe that that's what he's talking about at all. Because he uses a word in verse 10. When we think of a race, what is the normal purpose of running a race? <laughs> there you go. I know our society is so feely touchy and so worried about how kids think now that they have actual soccer games and baseball games and, and football games where they don't keep score. You know, that is so dumb to teach kids. <laughs> Because people keep score all the time. Your boss is going to keep score. Uh, your, your, your employers, your, your friends, everybody keeps score. Well, we don't want them to feel bad because they lost. They need to learn to get over it. Because life is full of winning and losing. Life, that is life. And if, if you don't get that in life, that there are victories... And there's defeats. Does God talk about victory, yes or no? Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over what? Victory over sin and death. Sin and death sometimes gives victory from our perspective. It's final, and we look at it like, what a tragedy, but not with Christ. He, we overcome that through the resurrection. Amen. So God talks about victory. He talks about defeat. Paul says in verse 10, he says, in verse, let's look at verse 9 to put it in perspective. He says, um, he, he uses that word win again up in verse, actually verse 8 is where he uses the expression. Here's what he says. He says, I have, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of the faith, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. So I believe that single-mindedness Paul had was that he wanted to win Christ. In other words, he wanted to win his approval at the end of life. You remember Jesus made the statement that at the end of life, there's going to be a statement made by God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what he was waiting for at the finish line. In other words, I want to win his approval. Isn't, aren't words the use of that in Scripture? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was constantly talking about not being ashamed. He says, for, he says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. We want to have his approval. He used expressions in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to, what? Please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So his single-mindedness was as he walked out the door of his residence, and he went out every day into the world that he would please him, that he would win his heart. David did that. What did the Bible tell, tell us of David? That he was a man after God's own heart. Abraham, he was a friend of God. 
he won God's heart. David used expressions, keep me as the apple of the eye. God, I want you watching me. I want you looking at me. Job got that. He said to Satan, God said to Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? God is saying to the devil, hey, I have my eye on him. Have you seen him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen him. Look at the protection you've put around him. I can't even get to him. You know, that's the same with all of us. God, uh, the devil can't get to us unless God gives them permission. And if he does give the devil permission, it's always for a good reason. And it's not always for judgment. It's for him to work in our lives. That we might be able to do more for him. So, verse 13, he has a singleness of purpose. And then there are three verbs, three words that he uses. And I want you to write these down. Number one, he says... This one thing I do, first, forgetting. Write that down, forgetting. It's the second point. What does that mean? Well, the word forget there means to put out of mind. And he says, forgetting those things which are behind. Now, I've taught on preaching this passage that that really relates to the past. And, to, and that's not doing an 